Okay, I have 501. We do appear to have a quorum, so I will call this meeting of the Transportation Policy and Funding Board to order uh, for Monday, August 15th, 2022. Uh, Sharon, if you'd please call the roll. Good evening. Um, Baltazar Deanna Santana, I believe he's excused for the night. Um, Barbara Harrington McKinney. Carolyn McAndrews. Present. Christopher McCahill. Chris McCahill. Are you not hearing me? Oh, yeah, I can hear you. Okay, cool. I see you, though. Eric Paulson. I am here. Yeah. Grant Foster. Here. Keith Furman. Present. Randy Udell. Here. And Mr. Thomas Wilson. Present. Okay, thank you. We do have a quorum. So the meeting is in order. Um, if our tech facilitator would please proceed with our standard virtual meetings opening statement. All right, welcome to our virtual meeting. We're going to cover a few basic items before beginning. If you lose connection at any point during the meeting, you can reconnect by clicking the link or calling the number in your original email. To members and city staff, members, if you are able, please activate your video and keep it on for the duration of the meeting. Staff, if you are able, please activate your video when you are speaking. Use the raise hand feature when you'd like to be recognized to speak ask questions, and ask questions. Staff, click raise hand when you are asked a question. The chair will do the best to call on committee members in the order in which their hands are raised. Lowering your hand will take you out of the queue. Members of the public who have registered registered to speak, the name you entered in Zoom must match the name you entered in registration. You will remain muted, muted until called upon. The clerk will tell you when your time is up. After speaking, a member of the body may ask you a question. If you need to share documentation with the board, please send it to the email listed in today's agenda. Chair, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Jesse. All right, approval of minutes from our August 1st, 2022 meeting, assuming all board members have had a chance to review those if they so chose. Is there a motion to approve? Move approval. Thank you, Alder Furman. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Chris. Any discussion? All those in favor of approving our minutes from August 1st, 2022, please unmute yourselves and say aye. 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 Opposed, no? Chair, please, it's unanimous. If you'd like to register a no vote, please raise your hand. Seeing no hands raised, it will get on as unanimous. Thank you. Um, I do not believe we have any public comment for items not on the agenda. That looks like it's still correct. Are there any communications, disclosures, or recusals from members of the board? Seeing none, we will dive into our first agenda item, which is star 66898, Complete Green Streets. And I'd like to ask the board that, without objection, that we suspend the rules to allow TC members who have been invited to this meeting to participate in the discussion, ask questions. See Ann there, just waving. So without objection, we will do that. Is there any objection? All right, seeing none, that we will do that. Um, all right, thank you. Great. Tom, should we go now? <laughs> oh yeah, sorry, Renee, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So thank you, everyone. Um, I'm here, Renee Calloway. I'm the Fed Bike Administrator. I have been here before. Um, and I have Adam Wood from Tool Design, who is our consultant on this project, as well with us. And he's going to lead most of the presentation tonight. It's been a little while since we've been here. So a few things are um, a little bit of a reminder to kind of get us back up to speed as we work on this again. Um, and then um, some of it just is kind of more detailed information for things that we've talked about just a little bit. Um, and then one of the big issues um, that has some discussion items is related to kind of this idea of modal priority, which um, you'll learn about more if you didn't have a chance to look at the materials. Um, and I don't know, Tom, did you have any introductory things you wanted to say before Adam jumps in? Uh, no, I think we... Uh... <clears throat> You know, obviously, we're excited about this one. We want to move forward. Uh, we do have some thoughts on uh, modal priority networks, and we put that in the memo so that we could just create an organized argument for you. And so, 
uh, look forward to just presenting all this to you. Thank you, Renee. All right, Adam, I'll turn it over to you now. Okay, thank you. I'm going to attempt to share my screen here. I think I've got the correct one up. Excellent. All right. Well, good evening, everyone. Um, as Renee said, my name is Adam Wood. I am with Tool Design. I'm based here in Madison and have spoken with you a couple of times about this project and I'm happy to be back to give you a bit of a refresher um, and also show you some new content, largely more on the aesthetic side of the spectrum in terms of what's new. Uh, the main three elements that we're going to talk about today are the modal hierarchy, uh, the modal priority networks and the street types. So a refresher on terminology, modal or mode, referring to the ways people move that can refer to driving, biking, taking transit, et cetera. Um, the hierarchy is a, uh, a, a upside down pyramid essentially that reflects the community values that we've tested through public engagement in various forms over the course of this project and really illustrates the order in which we're, we're going to prioritize different types of users and uses of the street by default. Um, the by default aspect is really important because that's where the priority networks come into play and they may adjust that in some um, instances or, or the ways in which different elements are included in a street design. The priority networks are overlays to the overall street network and as I said, prioritize different modes with the intent of forming a system of complete networks that are connected, safe and reliable. Um, the street types then are the context-based um, sort of what I like to refer to as starting points for street designs. Um, they are intended to be flexible, but they are intended to sort of cover the full spectrum. Uh, there will be streets that you're going to encounter over the next several years, I'm sure, that don't neatly fit into one of these categories um, or may start to blur the edges a little bit, and that's okay. These are really meant to be starting points. They're meant to um, convey intent and so forth. So with that said, um, the modal hierarchy, this slide likely looks familiar. We have um, shown you this a few times. Uh, we showed it to you as a tentative, then um, reflected the feedback we got from community input and, and talked about uh, the, the various sort of rationales for why we ended up this way. Essentially, it has walking and people using wheelchairs, essentially what we would refer to as pedestrians at the top of the heap, meaning we're going to first and foremost prioritize pedestrian safety and access in street designs. We then have transit and biking, and then all forms of motorized vehicles, including um, any future autonomous or semi-autonomous vehicles are all sort of fitting in a, a, a bin under there. And then we have parking on this as well. And, and parking itself is not a mode, but it is a very um, common use of our street space. And so we wanted to convey that, you know, parking is um, while important, is not necessarily uh, inherently taking precedent over other modes. Um, and these reflect, re um, relate to the street values of you know, putting people first, prioritizing safety over speed, supporting community in, in all senses of that phrase, um, prioritizing place and access and people, fostering sustainability, um, not only from a multimodal perspective of reducing carbon footprint of transportation, but also in the integration of green space. And we're not going to hit on it as much tonight, but we will in the future talking about how green infrastructure and canopy prioritization and so forth work in with this model as well. And then the last one, um, certainly not least, being centering equity, both in the process and in the outcomes of street design. One of the things that we wanted to touch on briefly is um, sort of a, a bit of a map of how all of these things fit together to help guide decisions. And sort of the, the step zero, essentially, the, the bit there in parentheses is that the modal hierarchy is not necessarily a, a step in the order of decision making, rather it's something that is, is sort of permeates everything within Complete Green Streets. It, it guides the decisions and it, or should guide the decisions through each step of the way. Um, but in orange, you can see kind of the, the, the highlights of each one. And, and so 
basically your process would be to look at the street type map. And I'm going to show you a map um, here in a few minutes and see what is the type of street that applies to the project. So if we're doing a project on Packers Avenue, look at the map, see what Packers is. There's your street type. Um, you then look at the overlay map and see if there are overlays present. Maybe it's a transit priority corridor. Maybe it's in a place that prioritizes um, distributed green infrastructure. Understand what those overlays are that apply. You would then look at the street type descriptions uh, and understand what are the typical elements that you would put in on whatever the appropriate street type is that you've identified for the project and how the overlays would influence it. So maybe you have a street that is an urban avenue. You would see what's the typical way, typical things that would go in. Uh, maybe it's also a bike priority network street. So you would look and see, okay, how do things change? How do we maybe reshuffle the, the micro priorities on that street to meet the needs of the bike priority network? Then you would look at the parameters tables to understand, you know, how wide should lanes be? What should our designs be? You know, really getting into the nitty gritty of some of the design parameters. And then finally, if you get to the inevitable um, aspect of we can't fit in everything we would love to have and you need to know how to make trade-offs, you would go back to those street type descriptions and the overlay maps and, and start to understand and, and do the, the negotiation from a design perspective to figure out what the priorities are. And so, as we go through the presentation, you'll see a lot of these things, at least in terms of the street type descriptions and the overlay maps and, and so forth and how they start to work together. So we wanted to first talk a bit about the modal priority networks and overlays. Renee mentioned there's been a lot of thinking and, and discussion that's gone into this. In orange on the slide are three modal priority networks that we're primarily going to speak about this evening being the transit priority network, the bike priority network, and then the potential for a pedestrian priority network or overlay of some sort. Um, these are again about modes. These are, these are forms of movement. There are also overlays that are a little bit different that apply. So equity priority areas and on the map on the screen, you can see these, these purple locations are the draft equity priority areas. Again, we'll, we'll come back and talk about that at a later point. Um, tree canopy priority areas, green infrastructure priority areas, and then just the reality of the national highway system and truck routes are streets that have higher traffic on them and they're things that we need to consider and accommodate to some degree for the foreseeable future as we're designing our streets. So I'm going to first hit on those, those three modal priority networks this evening. And there's two options. Tom mentioned the memo, and we sort of summarized it at a high level here, but there's kind of two options laid forth. And, and the first is to keep the um, essentially two modal priority networks in the mix, the bike priority network and the transit priority network. Um, again, remembering that pedestrians are at the top of the modal hierarchy so that the networks themselves would really just focus on these two. We've listed some alternative names here and would be happy to take any suggestions on which of these you like. Um, you can see in there all ages and abilities priority bike network or all ages and abilities connected bicycle network, key bicycle corridors, et cetera. The second option is to keep those two, but also integrate some form of a pedestrian overlay. Um, and this could be, we have a couple of examples to, uh, to discuss. One would be an accessible pedestrian network and the other would be an enhanced pedestrian network. And you know, just one thing to point out is that while we do have starting points for the bike priority network and the transit priority network, these would all be things that would evolve and, and grow over time. So whenever the bike plan is updated, when there is are changes to uh, the transit network or, or a new transit system redesign on in several years into the future, pedestrian plan, so forth, those would all be triggers to update and change these overlays. So the intent is for complete green streets to continue to evolve and, and flex with the various modal planning that you do as, as a city. So getting into the bike priority network, um, kind of structure here is purpose and goals on one side and then the implications on the other. The bike priority network is intended to be complete. It's intended to connect neighborhoods and key destinations. Obviously, context plays into the design and whether we're talking about side paths along roadways or protected bike lanes or bike boulevards. Uh, the map that I'll show you in a second, again, as I said, is, is a, it's a long-term planning document. It is aspirational, but it does need to be updated regularly. Um, the importance of it is it, it helps you to make decisions, but also helps in working with partner agencies like WSDOT um, and, and the county and so forth and can help with grant applications. 
So for streets on the network, these are identified as, you know, the really most critical connections. These are the line in the sand streets in essence. And if there is a street project that is overlaying the bike priority network, making sure a safe, comfortable, all ages and abilities bike priority or um, bike bikeway is included in that project is a, a paramount priority. Um, it, it may trigger some trade-offs that are perhaps a little bit uncomfortable, like removing on-street parking or, or doing something else, traffic diversion, lowering speed limits. You know, there's, there's other um, sorts of strategies that can be put into place there. But those are really the projects where the, you know, the key focus is on making sure that all ages and abilities network is, is the, the top priority, um, again, second to safety and comfort for people walking. For streets that are not on the bike priority network, again, the modal hierarchy still applies. So biking is still above driving when we have to make trade-offs. Um, it, the goal is still to achieve that all ages and abilities conditions if possible, but just with the understanding that those may be the places where, you know, to make trade-offs, we can't do everything on every single street. Um, streets that are not on the network is where we may look at making some compromises. Um, but again, that goal being for all streets or most streets to be bike friendly. So this is the initial map. Um, the dark green lines on here identify the, the preliminary bike priority network. And then the light green lines are, are used to illustrate additional secondary plans and, and existing bikeways as they stand today. So you can see that it's, it's still a, a pretty dense and connected network, especially in the central parts of the city. It makes connections to, you know, major neighborhoods, major destinations, crossing the barriers like the belt line going across um, uh, you know, John Nolan making those sorts of connections is still part of that priority network. On the transit side, the, oh, sorry. On the transit side, the, um, the priority network is, is really, again, reflective of the Metro transit uh, network design. Um, the preliminary network that's been identified is based on the high frequency routes within um, the plan. So any street that has 15 minute frequency on it, um, it helps to identify those corridors to make sure we're preserving them to provide the kind of transit service that's needed, whether that be dedicated transit lanes or space for adequate transit shelters and so forth. Um, you know, again, the, the intent of this is really to ensure that transit is able to operate at the maximum efficiency. Now, on some of these streets, they may not need a dedicated bus lane. They may not really need a whole lot of special treatments because of the conditions that are out there right now. Maybe there's not a whole lot of traffic on the street. Maybe there aren't a lot of conflicts out there today or, or foreseen in the future. Um, but we wanna make sure that the, um, the designs and, and operation of those streets are still prioritizing the, um, the efficiency of transit use. Um, again, here's the initial transit priority network map and you can see the relationship there with these draft equity priority areas. So uh, the, the second option we mentioned was including one of these pedestrian priority network um, elements or, or perhaps one or both. Um, again, that, that reminder that the modal hierarchy is still at play, even if you decide you don't feel like either of these are necessary. Um, the two ideas floated here are one, to create an accessible pedestrian network, which is going to really be based on filling in gaps in the, in the, in the sidewalk system. Um, the imagine, uh, Madison Tier 1 sidewalk map would be the starting point there. And it's really about prioritizing access to those sort of critical destinations of transit, schools, colleges, libraries, employment, and so forth. Um, and, and giving a little bit more of a nudge toward places where car ownership is lower or there are higher populations of people that don't have access to a car, or maybe only have one car in their household. So it's really kind of about access and, and sort of basic connections. The other is the enhanced pedestrian zones. Um, again, this would be created just like just like the accessible pedestrian network would really be sort of founded in a future pedestrian plan. So we don't have a map for you right now of what these would be. Um, but the enhanced pedestrian zones would be those highly walkable places. They would be places where we need to make sure we're going above the minimums of each street type that um, are in the street types. I'll show you in a minute. In a minute, um, providing more space for those sort of placemaking amenities as well, like benches and, and cafes and streeteries and so forth. And there would be some overlap with the accessible network in terms of schools and, and shopping areas, um, but transit corridors and so forth would also bubble up to the top there. So um, 
you know, this is kind of laying out those two options. And I did want to pause and ask Renee if there's anything she wanted to add um, sort of in the, the considerations of those different options. Sure. So I just, that was a pretty good description. I encourage you not to forget this. We have a, many other things that we're going to cover, but I'd really love to get your feedback. And I think, you know, obviously we have the modal hierarchy, so it's easy to say, do we really need these overlays? But I think, you know, when you think about bus rapid transit and the recent Metro network redesign, you know, that idea was to take a pretty good system and make it great. And I think, you know, the idea is the same with the with the bike priority network is taking a pretty good system and really finding the places where we can make it that great system that really provides connections throughout the city. And I think through thinking about that, this idea that maybe the same could be said for this idea of a pedestrian priority network, instead of saying, well, it's at the top of the modal hierarchy, you know, maybe that's good enough, is perhaps there's a place for this priority network that can really elevate um, certain areas and sort of accelerate um, what we're building out and how we're building it out and how we're making investments. So just something to think about, um, but we have quite a bit more, so don't forget about this section. All right. Okay, we're going to get to some pretty pictures now here in a minute, I promise. Um, so we're going to talk now uh, a bit about the street types. Um, this is likely familiar. We've shown you this slide before, but just a reminder that we have 11 street types that have been created. Um, they are, again, intended to be starting points for design. They are rooted in context. Um, they, uh, on this, this sort of matrix shown here, you can sort of see that the top left corner is going to be more urban, mixed use, and more on the busier street um, arterial end of the spectrum. So think East Wash. Um, portions of university and so forth up in that top left corner. Um, the top right corner are still gonna be busier streets, but lower density, more residential. So more of your parkway environments are falling there. As you move, so left to right is going from, you know, mixed use urban down to lower density, more residential. And then from top to bottom is busier streets to smaller streets. These are intended to be aspirational. So we don't necessarily have all of these right now on the ground in Madison, or they may not be uh, exactly ideal for what we want to achieve, um, but we have mapped out many, many, many of these. So all collectors and arterials in the street, we've applied these street types to each one of those. Um, some of those like the Woon Earth and Neighborhood Yield Streets are, are not really mapped out. And, and a lot of the others that have that asterisk on them aren't mapped out because we can't um, show you a map with every single local neighborhood street on it and you'd be able to read what it is because there's so many of those. Before we get into um, the maps and, and everything, I do want to point out the street zones. And we've talked about this concept of in the past, but we didn't have this graphic at that point in time. Um, to talk through all the trade-offs we make in street design and how we prioritize this versus that, it's really helpful to divide the street into different zones that, that kind of have different purposes and maybe um, we can prioritize between those. Um, one of the uh, key things to look at here is where movement is occurring versus stationary uses. So you can see we have a walkway zone in purple, a flex zone in sort of this greenish blue color, and then the travelway in orange. Movement is occurring in the travelway and in the walkway. Um, that flex zone is more about stationary uses. So parking, uh, cafes, benches, B-cycle stations, um, newspaper racks, all of that sort of stuff, the things that are not actually about movement of people is occurring within that travelway. Um, where people bike can either be in the travelway or the walkway, depending on the type of facility. Uh, if it's a side path, then it's gonna be more in the walkway. If it's a bike lane or say a bike boulevard, it's going to be happening in the travelway area. Now you might wonder about parking separated protected bike lanes, that's where we might see some splitting and multiple orange zones within a street. And that's all okay. But the, the point of this communication or point of this graphic is in the street zones is to kind of communicate purpose and intent for each of the street types. So here's a map um, of the street types. And again, you can sort of see if you look at that chart with the 
you know, blue being more mixed use and urban and the oranges and beiges being more residential neighborhood, lower density, you can sort of see how that plays out. Um, and you can see some pockets of blue out at East Town and West Town where there are, you know, plans and, and opportunities on into the future for um, some, some infill and, and redevelopment in those areas. Um, you can see the green kind of permeating throughout and you probably recognize a lot of those places like John Nolan and Seminole Highway and so forth that are kind of more Parkway green environments at this point in time anyway. Um, so I'm going to sort of go through these a little bit quickly. I could probably spend an hour talking about the nuances and details of each of these, but um, I'd rather go a little faster and have you ask questions if need be. So the Urban Avenue, again, this is the busier streets. We have some examples listed here. Um, East Wash um, from downtown to Starkweather Creek, University Avenue, um, South Park Street. Um, and you can picture where a lot of the redevelopment's happening on Park Street. Um, this is where, you know, it's turning into the Urban Avenue. And then some aspirational aspects. South Gammon at West Town doesn't look like this right now, but with some of the, the future land use and potential redevelopment, this is more the intent of where we would go with, um, with Gammon Road in that area. Um, these are streets that carry a lot of traffic, uh, a lot of car traffic, but also a lot of transit, tra transit traffic um, with the growth in mixed use development, a lot more foot traffic and, and a lot of potential for bike traffic as well. Um, the uh, you know functional classification is primarily going to be arterials, and you can see that target speed there. And, and these target speeds are the speeds we want people driving at, um, which applies not only to the posted speed limit, but also how how we design the streets and how fast the street feels like you should be driving on it. And this is all really in um, alignment with the changes to speed limits that um, you've been doing through your Vision Zero program. So for each street type, we have um, this list of, uh, you know, sort of this little description, narrative, examples, context. But we also have a, a table that breaks down these different zones. And you, so you can see, again, the color coding here of the purple is the walkway, that sort of blue-green is the flex zone. This is an example where we have a split flex zone, like I mentioned, with the parking protected separated bike lane. Um, and then the orange is travel way. Uh, within each one of these, you can see a priority designation. So on an urban avenue, the walkway and the travel way are high priorities. Um, the, the walkway, because this is a lot of mixed use, there's going to be a lot of foot traffic. The travel way, as I said, because there's a lot of traffic, whether that be on in cars or transit um, or, or even biking. Um, so those are the high priorities. The flex zone is still an important area. It's still a medium priority. But if we run out of space, the flex zone would be the first place we would start to trim from. We'd take a little bit of width away from the terrace, or maybe we might move on street parking in order to get the space we need for the travel way and the walkway. Um, so for each one of these, you can see descriptions about what typically would be included within each one. And then here's a map of where we have, again, this is currently, this is the working map that, you know, I, we fully expect you to make changes to over time as things evolve next future land use plan update, so on and so forth. Um, so you can see those corridors. Again, I mentioned portions of East Washington University, South Park, Gammon, so forth. Um, so Boulevard is kind of a similar type of street, except the context is different, but it's going to serve a similar function, conveying a lot of traffic, lots of overlap with the transit priority network as expected. Um, the far, further east portions of East Wash, Whitney Way, Cottage Grove Road, past Stoughton Road are all examples of where we would see this. Speeds are, you know, a little bit higher just in recognition of the uh, more suburban land use patterns that some of these will be located in, but still trying to trend a little bit lower than um, speed limits on a lot of current streets that would fall into this category. You can see here the travelway is still high priority. Flex zones become a little bit of a lower priority, um, and then walkway is medium. Now, again, with our modal um, uh, hierarchy, we would still maintain at least a standard sidewalk width on these, even if the walkway was um, considered low priority. We're still going to have the minimum there. There is a there's a floor at which we're not going to take away any more space from um, from from the walkway. Uh, on the map, you can see again these are going to be a little bit further out, more in some of the um, uh, residential areas. There are a few closer in, like portions of West Washington and and um, and Proudfit and, and so forth um, fall into that category. Parkway, 
Similarly, busy streets, um, these are going to be places where we're likely going to have a side path, and that's going to be probably the primary accommodation for people walking and biking. Um, I mentioned some examples earlier, some of which, um, like I didn't mention Packers Avenue earlier, that's maybe not quite as much of a parkway environment right now as John Nolan or Seminole might be, um, but that's sort of the intent is that that could grow into um, that sort of parkway setting. These are places where the walkway has a high priority, again, because these are often some of the major shared use paths um, in the city, uh, you know, Eastwood there, kind of the, the, the Capital City Trails along Eastwood. Um, John Nolan, I already mentioned a few times. Um, the flex zone is lower. Again, this is all relative. We still want to have wide flex zones if we can, wide terraces. We still want to have wide sh shared use paths. This is just helping you make decisions when you get into those situations where you can't fit everything in that you would like. A few examples, um, I'll throw out a couple I didn't mention earlier, Speedway being one, um, uh, Felland Road out on the far east side where new development's happening, uh, so on. Mixed-use connectors, uh, a little bit, again, this is kind of a similar setting to the Urban Avenue, but it's a, you can start to see it's a little bit of a lower-powered street. <laughs> There's not as many lanes, not as much width there. Um, Bassett, Broome, the Outer Loop, Wilson Street are, are current examples. We have some aspirational examples shown on the map. Typically have multi-story uh, buildings, a lot of mixed-use and so forth. Low target speeds, can be on arterials, can also be on collectors. So this is one where we start to see the travelway is not the high priority anymore. The walkway is the highest priority. The flex zone and travelway are both medium priorities. Um, you can see, you know, a description of what's typically located within those areas. Most of these currently are downtown, but there's some examples here and there. Fordham, um, out near the Hill Farm area, where we see these being uh, potential places where this street type can be applied. All right, Community Main Street, these are destination streets. These are streets with a strong sense of place. Um, they have a fairly high amount of traffic. Um, again, multimodal. Uh, so Monroe Street, Willie Street, Fair Oaks, um, Atwood and Regent are, are the examples we have identified. We've got a few other aspirational um, streets mapped as well. Uh, these tend to be uh, more of the small scale mixed use, kind of that more organic development pattern like you see when a, a you know a main street that's developed over decades target speeds 25 or less um, priority here this is one that, that really starts to turn things differently the uh, travel is a low priority and the flex zone is a high priority when you think about a main street a shopping street that on-street parking is really important um, the, the the terrace or sidewalk space for cafes or displays or b-cycle stations is also really important as well um, the walkway is also, you know, obviously important. It's shown as a medium priority. So if we, for example, said we want 10 foot sidewalks and a 10 foot terrace, and we only have 18 feet, we'd say, okay, let's do a 10 foot terrace and an eight foot sidewalk. And, and, you know, again, we have a minimum sidewalk width we're going to maintain, but this is just showing again where we would lean toward those trade-offs. So here are some examples. Um, we have some portions of South Park Street that are um, included here. Uh, Johnson Street, um, and then portions of North Sherman as well. Some of these are a little bit more aspirational, um, but they are envisioned as growing into this street type. So we have lots of community collectors, or sorry, community connectors across the city. Um, these are, you know, your typical uh, collector roads that carry, uh, you know, important amount of traffic. They carry transit routes, usually multiple transit routes on them. Um, they typically are surrounded by neighborhoods and, and provide some really critical connections. Target speed, again, on these is 25 or, or less. Can be on arterials, often on collectors. Walkway is, is the highest priority with the travelway as a medium priority on these streets. So you can see on this map, we have a lot of these. This is, you know, other than neighborhood streets, this is going to be, you know, one of your higher uh, um, more, your more common streets in terms of lane miles or center line miles of, of construction. We're now dropping down into more of our local streets, neighborhood streets. You see we don't have center line on this one for the majority of its length. Um, these are streets that are really about providing access more than throughput, relatively lower numbers. Um, you may still have some buses on these streets. Um, obviously biking is going to happen. Being in a mixed use area, you might have some loading zones like is illustrated on this graphic. Um, downtown areas, mixed use areas um, are some good examples of where these would occur. Target speed here, 20 miles 
per hour or less. Um, again, really focusing on creating safe, walkable conditions for people. Um, on these streets, the travel way is the low priority, the flex zone is the high priority. Uh, opportunities for street trees and benches and all the things that would make living in a kind of a more urban neighborhood appealing for people um, is what would be prioritized on a street like this. Uh, these are, again, predominantly in the downtown area, but there are some examples um, peppered outside of downtown. I mentioned the East Town Mall uh, area potential for some redevelopment in the future. Civic space is in a similar context, um, but this is where we start to get into streets that, that really have a, a wide range of design possibilities. So you'll see the examples on here include the Capitol Square, um, the diagonal streets downtown, MLK Boulevard. Uh, if you look at those, the cross sections currently are quite different on those streets. Um, and this is one where, again, there's a wide range of design possibilities here. But the intent is really kind of the same. And that's that we're creating a street that is less about moving car traffic. And it's more about being a strong place for people to be. Um, these are streets that, as you know, are often closed to traffic. It's where farmer's market occurs, where outdoor concerts occur, you know, so on and so forth. Target speeds here, 15 miles per hour or less. Um, and you can see that the, the travel way is really quite narrow on this compared to the other zones. The walkway and the flex zone here are both really high priorities. Um, these are places where if you were constrained enough, you might consider going down to you know, one travel lane for, for traffic, maybe making some of these one way like some of the you know, downtown streets already are. Um, you can see there's a lot more words on this slide and that's because we're talking about some, you know, pretty nuanced design elements about how parking maybe should work here, um, how biking might work, you know, generally not a dedicated bikeway here, but if this was a one-way street, maybe we provide a counterflow bike lane uh, of sorts to make it, um, you know, two-way accessible for people on bikes. Mostly in the downtown areas I mentioned, we went ahead and showed, um, you know, like East Campus Mall on this as well. And again, these could be constructed in other mixed use areas outside of the downtown area in the future. Um, if the conditions were right. Neighborhood streets, um, this is again, very, very typical neighborhood streets. These are the majority of what are um, built and maintained in the city. Uh, we do have identified on here a target speed of 20 miles per hour or less. Um, you know, for all the reasons why the 20 is plenty pilots are going on, you know, we've, we've uh, I know you've all talked um, a lot about the relationship between speed and um, crash severity and so forth. That's why we're really trying to emphasize lower speeds on neighborhood streets. Walkway being the highest priority, travelway being the lowest priority. And it's again important to remember that these all exist in a system and in networks. Um, so if every street has a low priority travelway, we still need to make sure there are continuous and connected routes for people driving, for people biking um, in, the, in those travelways. These are some examples of neighborhood streets. There's a lot more than this, but this is where we have collectors that are really more in this neighborhood street classification. So portions of Sherman Avenue and Baldwin are some examples. Um, portions of Toke are included on there. So you can you know, probably see some streets that you might identify. Very similar is a neighborhood yield street. And, and I'm sure many of you have been on streets where two cars can't pass each other at the same time. Um, we do have a lot of these. Riverside Drive is one that's been discussed quite a bit there along the Har River. Um, but there's numerous local streets uh, across the city that have this sort of condition. Um, we've had this as a separate street type because there are differences in lane widths and so forth that might apply. Um, also, these are streets where transit is, is not really compatible because of the, the widths. Neighborhood streets transit is compatible on um, similar priorities here um, with with the uh, the different the three different zones. Don't have a separate map for those, and nor do I have a map for the Winarf. But the Winarf this is our last street type. Um, this is one where you might notice there's no orange, there's no travel way identified specifically, and that's because the street um, itself is really intended to be kind of one giant flex zone. People can drive their cars on it. We want to encourage very low speeds. People can walk in the streets, uh, in the street as well. Um, it's intended to, uh, you know, serve as kind of an outdoor living room. Um, because of the type of conditions you need, this is really appropriate in a place that has higher density, where, as you can see here, the buildings are quite close to the street. So you have a very closed in sense um, feel of what that 
environment is like. Um, we do have on here a, a dedicated walkway, um, and that's for um, for providing year-round accessibility for people to walk. So it is generally like a back of curb sidewalk on one side of the street. A variety of reasons for that, partly which um, you know. Uh, a, a shoveled sidewalk is much more accessible for somebody walking, especially somebody with mo you know mobility limitations or challenges than a plowed roadway. And these are the types of streets that, frankly, are going to be really low priority plow routes. Um, the walkway and the flex zone are listed in the priority here, and that travelway is, is not applicable um, for the reasons mentioned earlier. So this is the the again the map of the street types. Um, We've provided you with this fly deck, and then also I believe Renee, the the large PDF map also went out that you know allows you to really zoom in and get into the nitty gritty of those. Um, this is the intended starting point to go in with complete green streets when it is finalized. But as I mentioned, this is um, envisioned to be something that does evolve and change over time as other information comes about and things are changed. So, um, you know, we're really happy now to get any feedback from you on this um, and I'll before I stop talking just say that you know coming out of this our next steps are to have some engagement around the finalization of this material um, and then we'll also be having some additional discussion on these other overlays including the green infrastructure overlay with you um, and then wrapping that all up with how you know the, the specific logistic aspects of how this all fits into the decision making framework. So with that, I will, I guess, Renee, turn it back over to you if you had any other follow-up and then. No, I think, I think that's good because um, we can send it back over to you, Tom. <laughs> Wilson. Thank you. All right. Um, questions, comments, discussion. Ian, go ahead, please. Sure, I'll start. You were looking for feedback as to whether we should have a uh, pedestrian priority network, and I I really think that we should. If um, if we look at um, the most vulnerable users, they're pedestrians, I think. And if we're going to have a bike priority network and a transit priority network, I think that we should um, also have a pedestrian priority network. And I'd be real interested. Uh, to hear from Tom Lynch and Renee and, and others with regard to the memo, because as I read through the accessible pedestrian network and the enhanced pedestrian network, uh, I really want both. Uh, and Adam sounded like that was a possibility. And when I look back through Safe Streets Madison, I look back through Imagine Madison, I look back through Madison in Motion, they both talk about connectivity, and they talk about safety. And I think about things that we see at the Transportation Commission, and we see places where we need sidewalks to, you know, that connection to be made, but then, you know, so we have sidewalks on one side, but then in the middle, we need to have sidewalks on both sides because it needs to be enhanced there, because there's park, there's schools. It's, um, you know, we had, you know, a recent huge discussion about that. So I see both as, as being really important and would be really helpful to us at the Transportation Commission to provide these guidelines that would say, yes, this is important. So when we as commissioners say, yes, this is important, see, here in Complete Green Streets, it, it, it reflects the importance of that. So I just want to throw that on the table as as what I what I was thinking as I was reading through those options in that memo. Yeah, and I can jump in. I mean, we kind of did set up that memo as an either or, but it doesn't necessarily. It could be an and. Yeah, and I might also say that it's not the enhanced pedestrian zones is not meant to be a um, a card to not provide minimum pedestrian accommodations you know it's 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 basically a special emphasis like i i think we would prefer to have sidewalks on both sides of every street you know what i mean uh, mm -hmm. so that it's not so much oh since we have pedestrian zones we don't have to put sidewalks on a half of the street i don't think that's the intent the intent is that we are anticipating the pedestrian volumes to be large enough that having a a wider sidewalk you know what i mean 
uh, a wider walkway as being um, desirable. Mm -hmm. So it's, and, and so that's a, a good way to put it because I, I, we don't want that to, we don't want it to be used as an excuse as saying, oh, it's not an enhanced pedestrian zone, so we don't have to do pedestrian accommodations. And, and that is not the intent at all. All right, Alder Foster, you're up next. Go ahead, please. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the presentation, all the good work. Um, I've got a bunch of notes. I'll just kind of run through them quick. Um, kind of starting in the beginning the um, with putting the parking on the modal hierarchy. Um, I like, I'm not sold on that uh, at this point. I, th I think I remember when I was looking at Chicago's, they intentionally did not include it and had kind of some interesting language around why they they didn't, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, I think, I mean, I appreciate sort of the ability to clarify that it's lower in priority than all of the travel modes, but it seems really fishy to me um, that we would call it a mode, you know, and sort of different from single occupancy vehicles. Um, and I like, if that's part of the flex zone, why don't we have street trees um, down in that fifth tier with parking or all the other things that are going to need to have the, the, the trade-off, you know, the, sort of the green elements. So um, I, I guess I'm curious how people's thoughts on that one, but I'm not, I'm a little suspicious of it. I think in some ways it actually does elevate it more than probably what we should be doing. Um, the other thing on the, on that general chart is um, biking um, down below. I know we've kind of had some conversations in the past, I guess maybe um, when you come back and with the like decision-making framework, um, maybe an ask would be to actually frame a question around that and have an alternative that doesn't, um, I think it was Minneapolis that had it uh, maybe with transit and biking on the same one. Um, or I can't remember which ones that were, but I, I can't exactly tell you why it doesn't look good and feel good to me. Um, obviously I'm a, I'm a big bike advocate, but I d like, I think it's just more harm than good doing it that way. And um, I think I think also maybe just because it separates biking so much from walking and, and wheelchairs um, in my head, that is sort of the wrong direction. Um, I think thinking of, of human powered transportation more, um, it, there's a lot of, a lot more similarities um, than not. Um, at, at some point, maybe at the next meeting, if, if someone could walk through maybe an example or two of the dis decision making process, um, you know, maybe even like a, a recent project or one coming up, or I mean, it could be a made up one, but I think it would be helpful for me to see how that would actually be implemented um, or, or how it would like, how the thinking would go through it. Uh, I would say yes to the, um, including some form of um, all ages and abilities in the bike network. Um, I think that, uh, I think it, I think we, that's what that one should be focused on. And I think, um, I think both for that and the, and the pedestrian, which I also support having a pedestrian priority network, I think both of them should focus on connectivity, um, and, 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 and accessibility sort of for all users. So on the, on the bike front, um, to me, the network should really focus, um, on, how much of a network can be connected together and including uh, street crossings and, you know, have, have red marks and gaps where we don't have a signalized crossing or, you know, those sorts of things. So really focusing on that all ages and abilities network um, and how, how much we can get that connected in. Uh, for the PED network, uh, again, I think, yes, we should. Um, I, I kind of feel more drawn towards the accessibility um, sort of framing of it. Um, and again, I think, you know, really focusing on gaps in a, in a, in a true sort of priority sidewalk network seems like a good idea. Um, focusing on, on difficult, unsupported, um, dangerous street crossings as part of that um, all sounds good to me. And I think we should have a, a, a map and a, and a list of where we need to really focus energies. Um, I'm not opposed to the enhanced pedestrian zone. Um, it feels a little bit more almost like an enhanced flex zone when we're talking about um, seating and art and those sorts of things. So I'm mean, obviously integrated with good walking experience, but um, it just seems a little, seems like it's more around kind of the entertainment side or the staying part um, less than the sort of mode of, of walking. 
um, in the uh, the only thing with the bike network, I guess, just to make sure that somewhere else in the plan, it's very clear. And I know you said it in the presentation, but I, I think there's going to be an instinct for folks to look at that bike priority network and say, oh, it's not on the bike priority network then somehow, even though biking modal hierarchy, it's up there, we sort of allow, say, oh, yeah, we don't want to stress people about taking, you know, on-street parking away because it's not on the bike priority network. And I think that would be a huge mistake. Um, so I, th I think, again, focus more on not just, like, what is the whole um, existing network, but what, where do we want to focus in the on the bike priority network to close key gaps? Um and then in the like the zone section and the um, uh, typologies, one thing that stood out for me that seemed a little bit weird was the sort of the coloring on and the definitions of the walk zone versus travel versus flex space. Um, and especially thinking about like where biking fits in there and kind of connected to that comment I said before about m sort of more akin to pedestrians um, than, than cars. And in some of the examples, like, um, I think maybe the parkway was an interesting example where you've got a shared use path, um, obviously. So then it gets colored kind of purple, like a walkway, right? Um, and then I think that the next example, um, what, what comes after parkway? Uh, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So then here, it's like a, yeah, like a separated shared use path kind of next to it, but then it's colored red, like the travel way. So there's just, for me at least, there's a, there's, I think this is useful graphic and it feels, it would feel more interesting to me to kind of, um, have, have, I mean, walking and biking are just so much closer in so many ways and in how we're thinking about our street space, um, and, and connecting those more rather than, um, I feel like biking is kind of getting lost in weird ways when it's in that, the, tr the travel way, um, or, we could call the sidewalks part of the travel way and just say that this is all, you know, these are all the modes that are about moving and uh, that's what it is. Um, the community main street and um, um, I think it was a mixed use neighborhood or neighborhood streets, a bunch of those, like, I, it seemed like there were a bunch of like collector streets that show no bike facilities, um, which I think is a real problem. Um, and I'm not even, it's not clear to me. I think some of them in the description said like collectors and local. Um, and so, yeah, maybe not this one. Um, although did, I don't know. I think one of those didn't even have, did that one have separated bike facilities? Yeah, yeah those so, two do. Okay, that one is, yeah. So maybe it was the next one then. Um, not that one. Keep going. Maybe one more. So, oh, here's the one. Mixed use neighborhood street. So this said collectors and locals. So I think that's sort of like more downtowny. But in my mind, once you know, if you're going to have a collector street, we should be showing separated bike facilities. Period. Um, so that feels weird to me that there's it's one typology for a collector and a local, um, even downtown. But then especially if you go to the next. Um, one to the, I think, regular neighborhood st street. Uh, yeah. So this one to na so neighborhood street collectors and locals. This one feels really problematic to me. Like that looks like a local street to me, not a collector. Um, and I think when you showed these on the map, it looked like you were actually only showing mostly the, the collectors like Dempsey Road, for example. I mean, that has a center line that should have separated bike facilities. And it's just a completely different street typology in every way from every other street that comes off of it that's a true local street, but it's not a yield street because it's too wide. So I don't, I think that needs to get resolved and it, that one's really important um, to me. And I, I would hope that all in this, in the complete and green streets, I mean, anything that is, that has um, a level of motor vehicle traffic that, it, you know, in that collector range, but, you know, over a, th a thousand cars per day, 1500, um, needs needs to be showing separated um, bike accommodations in my opinion uh, I really like that the um, 
you've got the neighborhood yield street in there. I think it is a good idea to put that in there. And I'd like to actually see us consider that um, for reconstructs going forward and skinny stuff up to create more of those. So it was nice to see that one in there. And then the, I think my last comment is just around um, the one earth uh, one with a sidewalk, which is weird. Um, and I, so I don't know if we want to get into this conversation today, but I know, you know, I've had conversations with staff around this. I think, um, I, I, I couldn't support this the way it is. I think it's really problematic. And I think it's a little bit of, it would be a weird thing to sneak in there. Um, I think we need to, I need the board has to have a real honest conversation about sidewalks on local neighborhood streets, um, in, in already built up areas, the sort of rural to urban retrofit. Um, cause we, at this point, all I'm seeing is people are just gonna, staff's gonna be looking at everything shows a sidewalk and, um, I'm, I cannot understand how that's happening on every project in areas of my district. And I, th I would prefer to have that policy conversation and give some clear guidance to TC because otherwise I feel like it's just going to set up a lot of unneeded um, hostility there. So I know it's hard to take that question on and maybe it feels like too much, but I think if we don't, if we don't address it in a meaningful way as part of this, um, I think we've, I think it would be a, a real missed opportunity. And I th and for me, this one earth slide is a bit of a punt on that. So um, yeah, maybe we can have a, a more dedicated conversation about that. And thank you all for your patience. I know that was really long-winded, but I wanted to get it all out, thanks. All right, thanks. It looks like uh, Tom or Adam and or Adam want to respond or, or provide some feedback to that. So go ahead, other one of you. Yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead and start. Um, <clears throat> as far as the, the Warner, I think a lot of what uh, tools presented here has to do with they were enlisted by FHWA to do accessible you know, pedestrian street design, and they they prepared a report. And so some of this guidance is based on that report, and, and maybe that would be a discussion that we could have with you or. Actually, I shouldn't have it with you, but maybe tool, you could interact with tool on, on that report that they did. Um, I do have a, a question um, regarding um, the last one that you were talking about. And I'm just going to go to, uh, was it Jennifer Street? You know, I think Jennifer Street is a, it's a little bit of a borderline. You know, it's actually above, it's above a thousand cars per day, and yet it's a bike boulevard. Um, so Jennifer Street, we could strip parking, you know, put in bike facilities, but it's 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 kind of in that gray area. And, and um, so this was meant to be more of a discussion topic, like um, you know, we have we don't have a lot of Jennifer Streets in the city, but we have some Jennifer Streets where um, you know the volumes are kind of in they're either slightly below all ages and abilities they're slightly above all ages and abilities but they're kind of traditional neighborhood streets with on street park. i would i mean i would say on that i think jennifer is probably the worst <laughs> example it was something one of the most unique in a lot of ways but um i think the 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 one that you're actually going to see all the time is the sort of more regular collector street in most of the neighborhoods around madison and i think it's the the, the biggest best opportunity to, imp to drastically improve our bike network in the next five to 10 years is having the commitment to swap on street parking for bike lanes and buffered bike lanes on those collectors. So to me that, and if we, if there's not agreement um, with the board, then that would be like, we sh I would like to know if there is because that to me is what this is about. So yeah, Jennifer, I mean, you, as you know, there's plenty of tools and, and flexibility in this whole thing to kind of wiggle your way down um, from what's shown. But I think aspirationally, these, you know, the, the, the drawings, which is what so many people are going to see and, and the takeaways should be showing collector streets with separated uh, bike facilities. Adam, did you want to jump in? Yeah, so I, I did, Tom kind of, mentioned what I was going to say about the wound earth and that's, you know, it really comes down to an accessibility um, component and, and the work that we've done for FHWA included a lot of research and case studies and, and looking at places with the type of snowfall and snow cover that we have and so forth and, and just really finding that um, there aren't any examples uh, currently of streets that remain accessible in the winter without a 
concrete um, path that's that's really more hand cleared or cleared with like a uh, like a roller brush type of thing, like what happens in the downtown area. Um, and then assuming you know we're not going to have that sort of maintenance in neighborhoods outside of downtown is kind of one reason for including that. Um, on the the other the discussion about the neighborhood streets or the local streets, um, you know, it's a really good point. I think it's important that regardless of, and I know this gets tricky, but regardless of um, the street type, the context is really critical and the traffic volumes and the speeds need to be considered in um, determining what type of bike facility is included. So we have, and, and sort of intentionally, we, lo we listed collectors or sorry, several collectors as neighborhood streets. And, you know, one, the ones that stand out in my mind based on where I live are North Baldwin Street and Sherman, which are both collectors. They are both certainly neighborhood streets. North Baldwin especially has numerous driveways on it, lots of kids playing um, outside, and is certainly a street that I don't think would want to have a, you know, center turn lane and, and all of that sort of stuff um, on it. And so, you know, it, it does kind of um, come to the question about the traffic speeds and volumes and what do we do? Do we take away the parking to put in bike lanes or do we say it's a neighborhood street? Let's instead focus on ways to either divert traffic or lower traffic speeds or so forth to create a more comfortable environment. And I think it's sort of the the question that we're trying to, to spark with some of these decisions. So um, anyway, the, the short response there now that I've given the long one is essentially that the speeds and volumes are critical in determining what the facility should be. Um, and, and that can be more clearly identified in a variety of ways, but I think it's also important to not set a precedent that or an expectation that every neighborhood street is going to have bike lanes on it. Just to clarify, when you say not every neighborhood street, that's because you're lumping collectors and locals as all one kind of street. Well, again, I, it's, it, it's about the context. And unfortunately, there are a lot of streets that are classified as collector streets that are, you know, slightly above the traffic volumes of some that are not. And there are streets that have gotten higher volumes of traffic on them because of their just where they're positioned in the network that people that live on those streets would want it to function more as a neighborhood street than it does currently. Yeah, and maybe it's maybe it's like isthmus um, bias or something because like I get it when when you talk about the ones that you mentioned and what and Tom mentioned Jennifer, but you get out in like the rest of the city where it's like regular newer development uh, local street versus collectors, and those collectors are gnarly. They're not like Jennifer Street, and that's the norm around the city. So maybe to me, there's if you if the end of the day you say there's neighborhood streets, including local and art and collector streets in a neighborhood in my neighborhood are one type of street. It just doesn't make any sense at all to me. And maybe those are ones that should be reclassified instead of as being neighborhood street, we should classify them as a community connector. Could be one possibility. Yeah. Or a neighborhood connector or something. I mean, it's, a, it's, but they're all, they're all the ones that are on that have been on the list for a long time as the highest speeding, all that kind of stuff. If they're either arterials or these neighborhood connector streets, so maybe a community connector would work. All right, Chris, you're up next. Go ahead, please. Thanks. Um, just based on that conversation, I think there's a ton that we could dive into and probably can't do it in a venue like this to work out details like that. Um, so I'll weigh in a little bit, but just start by saying that I really love how this is to coming together. I think having the street typologies is very helpful um, and it's helping me think about how this is going to work a little bit better. Um, I guess just responding to that recent conversation about collectors and, and bike facilities and stuff, I think um, um, I mean, part of the problem is that like the the classification of some of these roads as collectors and locals and whatnot is just not great. Um, and I think it's important to keep in mind that um, regardless of what the picture of 
this, you know, this, this visualization that we're seeing in front of us, like we're still going to fall back on engineering decisions like NACTO guide and like when a road needs a protected facility or not. Right. I think these typologies are just a starting point. <clears throat> um, so that's the way I'm seeing it. So I don't, I don't know. I don't see the same issue that I think maybe Elder Foster is seeing. Um, and then um, just related to that, the issue of, of parking in the modal hierarchy, I think, um, you know, we, we've heard a lot of, I, we, we saw in, in the presentation earlier that there was a lot of concerns about parking. Um, and I think taking it out of the typology would suggest that, you know, we're no longer concerned with parking on street and we are. Um, so I think it's important to lay out how that fits in the scheme of things. Um, and there are places in, in the city where on-street parking is critical. So um, maybe one thing that I would suggest to, to tweak that a little bit is that it's not just parking that we're talking about. We're talking about stationary uses, which could be bike parking. It could be um, streeteries. Um, so maybe that's a better way of, of thinking about it. Um, when it comes to a, a, an example like Jennifer Street, I I think probably the board is not in agreement on, you know, whether that needs a, a protected bike facility or not, um, partly because it's complicated, like there's parallel roads. Um, I think each road's serving different functions and it's a tricky area. So um, I think uh, I was gonna go to a larger point now after just sort of running through a checklist. So I, I think I'll do that um, unless maybe I don't, yeah, I guess I'll do that, that makes sense. Unless someone wanted to respond to one of those specific things <clears throat> on staff. Tom, looks like you might. Go ahead if you want to do. Uh, actually, uh, no, I had a, a statement to respond to the previous all the fosters, but I, uh, what you just mentioned is, uh, I will say regarding like streeteries and on-street parking and lumping them together is, that's an interesting concept. Maybe that would be a, a way to do that. Uh, the mine rules were in response to maybe more all the fosters now. I'll wait my turn on the queue. Okay, thanks. Um, so my bigger point, I think, so I understand how we have these street types now that seem super helpful. Um, I'm not convinced the pedestrian the pedestrian overlay concept makes any sense at all. Um, mainly, not because I disagree with that we should be prioritizing it, but that it feels like a pri pedestrian prioritization is already built into this all over the place. Because um, we've got the modal hierarchy that puts pedestrians at the top. We've got street types that many oftentimes say pedestrians are the highest priority. Um, I would assume and hope that the transit priority areas also prioritize pedestrian um, modes. Um, so at the end of the day, there's not gonna be a lot of cases where pedestrians aren't at the top of that priority. Um, so when it comes to like design, design decisions, like should it be like an enhanced pedestrian space? I don't, maybe there's room to put that in here, but I think, I don't know. I think those cases are going to be kind of obvious. Um, so I guess I had uh, uh, maybe a question about that, and I'm drawing a blank. Um, oh, I know. I know the one, one last thing I want to say. So it feels like maybe we have confusion about how this is going to be used. Like we have, we have, we're going to use like project prioritization to fill network gaps. And that's not what this is, right? So we're gonna be using like safe streets money to, to fill, to improve crossings in dangerous places. And, you know, we're going to be working towards pedestrian improvements. I don't see this as the tool for doing that. This is the tool for showing a template for design and weighing trade-offs. So pedestrians are never gonna lose in the way that this is, this is framed. So maybe, um, Maybe someone could speak to like, am I misunderstanding that, or is that a fair assessment that we've already got? We've already got that covered. I mean, I can jump in. I think in many ways we do have that covered, right? Like as you look at the hierarchy, as you look at each of the street types, I think, you know, the discussion is whether we think having something helps elevate it even more um, in other ways. Uh, and and maybe the answer is no, right? I think 
it's good to hear, you know, kind of differing thoughts on that as we move forward and how we see like that would or would not add value to um, kind of that decision making process. Yeah, I guess my concern would be that we're, we're overcomplicating it. Like we've got a, a handful of rules that already say like there needs to be sidewalks here. Um, and then just in case it doesn't, that isn't enough. We bring in a, a pedestrian overlay that says, yes, we, we extra require pedestrian sidewalks here. And I'd like to see this as simple as possible. Um, so I think that's everything. And I see we've got a lot of questions up there. So I'm going to end there. All right. Thank you. Um, and Kovic, you're up next. Go ahead, please. Uh, thanks, Tom. Um, I'm going to respond to a few things that people said. Um, first was with regard to not showing parking in the modal hierarchy at all. And um, I'm really afraid of taking it off there because one of the things that we deal with all the time at the Transportation Commission is people saying, don't want buffered bike lanes because you have to take my parking away. Don't want sidewalks because you have to take my parking away. And having it visibly at the bottom, to me, just really re-emphasizes re that it, it is at the bottom. And that, um, and certainly there are going to be times when parking is important, as Chris was saying, uh, but that in terms of priorities, um, that I think it's important to, to keep that going. And um, I was also in, um, and I've, I've heard this discussed before, the possibility of maybe putting transit and biking on the same line. I've seen that in other cities as well. And um, that's, you know, I think that's intriguing to think about. Um, with regard to um, the, uh, let's see. With regard to not showing a pedestrian priority network, you know, in preparation for the meeting, I went back and looked at Imagine Madison, Madison in Motion. Safe Streets Madison, and in every everywhere it talks about both the bike and pedestrian networks and closing gaps in both of them. And while I agree with what everybody's saying that pedestrians are at the top, I'm just afraid if if we don't have an overlay, if we don't talk about a pedestrian priority network that somehow it, it will not seem as important if we don't have that priority shown. Uh, because I've, of all of the things that um, I've been trying to champion with Safe Streets Madison and other things, you know, pedestrian and bicycle safety is just right up there at the top. And, you know, the best way to do that is to close the gaps and to provide for that um, all ages and ability um, networks for everybody, both when it comes to walking and, and biking. Um, and, and, you know, sidewalks, we hear about that all the time at Transportation Commission. Um, and, you know, having everything that we can to support that um, makes it easier. You know, we've had some real contentious discussions about sidewalks at Transportation Commission and having all the ammunition and complete green streets showing the priorities and Having the importance of those networks, um, I just think that would be really helpful. So, thanks. All right, thank you. Um, Alder Paulson, you're up next. Go ahead, please. Yeah, so I've got a couple of notes here. Um, on the pedestrian overlay stuff, I would love just to hear, and I'm not asking for this tonight. Uh, maybe this is a memo. Maybe this is at a future meeting. I don't know. But just explain a little bit more with some like actual practical locations of where this would go and what it would actually do. Um, right. When I first kind of was looking at this, I thought, ah, well, this is kind of like State Street and maybe the uh, John Nolan, uh, Monona Terrace walkway, you know, places that that pedestrians really are out and about using it. But if it was something else, like what would this look like if we said, OK, we're going to put this somewhere along East Wash or somewhere along Milwaukee Street is like translate that into uh, something. And and, um, and and certainly pedestrians are at the top of the list of, of things just from a pure safety perspective. Like I want to bend over backwards to make sure that we aren't uh, hurting people 
um, as we're as we're moving folks around. But how much of that is just uh, things that we're already doing through through Safe Streets, Madison, the the high injury network, and 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 there, and how much of this is like things that we actually want to enhance the pedestrian experiment experience, which might be changing the way that we're we're building the streets or making the sidewalks wider, or more amenities, or we are saying on this particular thing, we're going to commit to the city doing the street clearance to make sure that the sidewalks are 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 cleared up after. Uh, snow and they're done well and and uh, we come back and salt them and 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 make uh, make that uh, happen so just somewhere let's maybe just help us understand a little bit more about kind of what we're thinking uh, in this um, um, for for names of the things I actually like key bicycle routes and key transit routes um, um, as as names or key bicycle corridors um, Sorry, instead of, of priorities, um, just a minor thing, but I think key bicycle uh, priorities or key bicycle corridors kind of helps explain it and, and, and does a nicer job uh, uh, there. Um, you know, on bike and transit uh, service, I, I would not put them at the same spot. Um, uh, I would, they're very, you, you, you do different things to, to make them happen. Um, you know, what, what the solutions are, where, where this fits, um, I think, is different. Uh, again, like pedestrians, I want to bend over backwards to make sure that that we don't hurt people in bikes. Bikes, for me, uh, I don't know, sweat, uh, bugs, and in rain. Uh, no thanks. I'm not getting on a bike. But um, I have a a lot of people who I care an awful lot about uh, who do get on bikes. Uh, and as much as I wish they would be in a car, would have a big uh, crumple zone around them. Um, uh, you know, that's not what they're doing. Uh, but but I, I do want to like really push on, on bicycle safety. Um, and so I'm really intrigued by having more buffered bicycle uh, uh, facilities and, and uh, doing more parking. Is there anywhere in Madison that we are doing um, separated parking? I can't think of one, um, but, but maybe there, there is, if there is, a, that's really cool. Um, and if we can use the parking for something actual useful and, and have, Bikers hit park or drivers hit park cars instead of bikers. I think that's fantastic. I would rather okay. I'd rather not have anything, but if they're going to hit something, I'd rather they hit park cars than than bikers. Um, and um, oh, and and I don't want to relitigate this. If if we spent two years thinking about it before I got here, um, the number of the number of street types. Um, it eleven feels. I mean, we're up into like almost the same number of zoning. Uh, uh, districts, if we could get that down a little bit, it might help some discussion in part because I don't ever want to have to use the word woofnoffin or woofner for a, in a uh, in a, a neighborhood meeting and explaining explaining any of this. But I think it'd be a little easier to uh, explain things down, or explain things if there were just a few or from maybe we need them because there's a lot of crazy stuff happening downtown. In District 3, we don't have that many different types of streets. Um, and I think it'd be a little easier to collapse the number of cars. Classes down, and uh, I had something else, but um, but we can come back to it later. So, thanks. All right, thank you. I, I believe Bassett Street has some uh, parking corrected bike lanes uh, north Bassett. Um, Harold, you're up next. Go ahead, please. Yeah, thanks for providing the opportunity to provide some transportation commission perspective, as Anne has already done. Uh, just a few things, pedestrian priority network. I'm also not 100% sure what it does and maybe Alder Paulson's suggestions of coming up with some specific examples of where it would change things might be helpful. I think from my perspective, pedestrian priority network, I mean, it's very easy to think about. And if you look at all the nice pictures of the cross sections of sidewalks and sidewalks are super important as and has pointed out they are contentious in some cases. But I think for me, the piece that's really missing here, and that is maybe the more important piece where we need to focus on pedestrians, is really the intersections, the crossings, where you say like, you know, pedestrians have the priority, but they need to cross six lanes of traffic or maybe six lanes plus two turn lanes, and it's gonna be an unsignalized intersection. So I think that's gonna be a little bit difficult if of most of what we're looking at is like what happens between intersections. But I think making clear that that's a key piece of pedestrian safety, I think that's really important. And maybe that helps us think about whether 
we need to think about it like we should call the modal priority network or maybe it's better wrapped in some of the other things. So I'm not totally sure how that best works, but I think that's really key to keep in mind. Um, coming back to the parking and the modal hierarchy, I mean, I think taking it out is not a good idea and adding things like deliveries, streeteries and all of that. I mean, on the one hand, I don't want to lump those all together, but if thinking of this concept of the flex space, I mean, or stationary uses of space, I think it would be good to have then all those things enumerated in there and not just parking, but taking it out doesn't seem to really solve the issue. And then one final point, I mean, I really like the example cross-section drawings. Um, two concerns I have with them is, I mean, they have this nice target speed next to them. And then I look at the cross-section of like, you know, you have two travel lanes in each direction. You have like on-street parking and you have a target speed of 25 miles an hour, like East Wash. And I ask myself, well, how do you, that's, people are not gonna drive 25 miles an hour here. And so I think thinking about what needs to happen to a cross section, what needs to happen to a street so that actually those target speeds are achievable. And that's not just true for large intersections, but uh, for the large cross sections, but also for some of the neighborhood streets where you have one street parking both sides, two full size travel lanes, and you expect people to go 20 or below I think we have seen that that's not really how that works. So being clear about how we can get those to those target speeds, I think is really important. And then I think the other thing with just the visuals, I still see an awful lot of street parking there in most of the types. And so being very cautious that, I mean, I think those images are powerful and if people see them and they have like a residential street with on street parking on both sides, then that's going to be the expectation of what streets are going to look like. So maybe thinking about that as well. I think that's all I had to say there. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Harald. Um, let's see. Tom, you're up next. Go ahead. Okay, yeah. Uh, this is more regarding the, the hierarchy between um, bikes and and uh, transit, and I'm just going to make a statement rather than a philosophy. Um, when we look at the north-south BRT and the east-west BRT, um, you know, there was a tough decision on what to do on East Washington Avenue, uh, for instance, and it's it was difficult to reroute transit off East Washington to preserve the, the bike facility, um, but we could make some accommodations with bike, and uh, Similarly, with Park Street, we are looking at cross sections um, on Park Street, and we um, um, are actively considering capacity reduction, which is a uh, so. But you know, the Park Street will be used for the North South um, BRT. You know, it, it, it's in in the plan. And right now, we are looking at different avenues, including capacity reduction, to make sure that we fit everything. But those are the kind of the situations where how do we how do we address that you know and that's so that i'm just kind of making a, a statement of what what exists so thanks all right alder paulson you're up next go ahead please yes yeah, it'll be real quick because i remembered uh, my other things um Certainly not tonight, um, uh, but if we actually do need to go back and have a sidewalk discussion uh, in the context of pedestrians, I thought we'd sort of settled that as a city a long time ago, and it's it's uh, sidewalks on both sides of the street, unless there's some weird thing like the houses are just too close, uh, and I thought we had mostly done that in most places, um, but if we need to go back to that, I would, uh, I'm ready to have that fight, and I haven't had it uh, yet, maybe everyone else is bored of it. Um, uh, and then the other thing I'd love to talk about um, with some of these uh, street types is uh, what happens in the winter um, and how do these uh, work uh, while we're trying to clear the snow? What happens if the snow clearing doesn't happen quite right? And what happens, how well do these streets uh, still work and what are the snow clearing implications for a lot of these, um, if there's anything special? Some of them, are, most of them are, uh, and it doesn't change a whole lot, but uh, if there are places where the snow 
snow clearing um, mechanics. Uh, and especially if it's a bad storm, and we don't get to everything and it ices up and everything goes to hell. Um, you know, how do these streets uh, keep function? So maybe a little bit of a, a description on, on, on some of the street types, especially things that are maybe going to be a little bit new of, hey, what does this mean for uh, plow and snow would be helpful. Thanks. All right, Alder Foster, you're up next. Go ahead, please. Thanks. Uh, I just wanted to support what I think Chris uh, mentioned and, and Harold um, also about. Um, I'd be I'd be fine leaving parking on there um, if it's more of like the flex zone layer um, and showing street trees, seating, streeteries, bike parking, etc. I think that gives that actually makes more sense that overall we are um, there's modal hierarchy for the travel modes but all of the travel modes are sort of getting their needs met and then what's left um, gets divvied up among those other things so i think that makes sense um to um alder paulson uh i can give you a great tour in district 15 miles and miles of streets without sidewalks including ones that were reconstructed just a year ago uh, without any sidewalks and without anybody arguing for them so there's a there's a lot of um former non-Madison town of Blooming Grove, town of Madison, it's a real big deal. Um, town of Burke, uh, they're, they're all over and retrofitting them is a real is a real deal. And especially if you come out saying sidewalks on both sides, it's just literally not practical in, in locations. So um, it sounds like we should have that, that discussion. Um, and then uh, Tom, uh, you had raised a question about sort of the, the basically putting transit above um, bikes. Um, in giving the, the sort of the use case of East Washington or, or Park Street, um, you know, I, I think that actually is part of why I don't like that differentiation. And I think anybody that understands, um, you know, how we've split up East Washington as we're prioritizing buses over bikes uh, is only because we're all uh, still prioritizing motor vehicle access to such a high degree. We have seven lanes <laughs> of East Washington for car travel. And um, yeah, we gave up some, um, you know, not, not awesome uh, bike lanes for BRT um, lanes, but that's because we couldn't get ourselves to reduce capacity or we couldn't get the state to let us or whatever. But that's, I, I think that's the, that's the key in on University Avenue. You know, I mean, we, there was serious conversation at Transportation Commission. I know key staff, you know, raised questions about, um, both what we were doing for, for transit lanes as well as bike facilities. And, you know, to me, that was, that was us dealing with where we're at. And I mean, I voted in favor of it, but it, it wasn't a complete street project. And I think that is, I would rather just be honest about that and say, no, we we failed to accommodate bikes on university Avenue realistically. And, and it was a really hard street to do that with. And, here we are um, and hopefully in 20 years 30 years we've got such a kick butt transit system and everything else that when we have to look at it again we could do a lane reduction um, but you know as a community I think we're just not there yet but I don't I don't think to me that's not a reason to to, to prioritize transit over bikes I just I think it sets up a tension that doesn't actually exist and we should keep the focus where it's at which is carving out the needed space for all those modes and the place that we have to claw it back from it is from cars, period. Thank you. All right, uh, Chris, you're up next. Go ahead, please. Thanks. Just a couple of things that occurred to me. I want to put a pin in. Um, one is on the the Warner question. Um, we probably should come up with a different name for it, but I think there are places in the city that really should be a, a Warner, and that doesn't have sidewalks in my mind. Um, so I think we do need to have a conversation about what, what that looks like and where it's appropriate. Um, based on what I'm hearing, I, I feel like there was a point in time where we put buses and bikes on the same level, but maybe like separated them and had them both sort of um, in that space so we could have conversations about that trade-off. Um, I'd be open to that if, if that makes any sense, the way this plays out. And um, one last thing that nobody mentioned, um, I noticed um, sometimes um, the street types designate low priority travel ways, which makes sense to me. Um, but I think we should consider where there are um, emergency response routes, because that always seems to create um, challenges when we talk about low priority travel ways. And 
it turns out there's fire trucks or something using it frequently. That's it. All right, Ian Govich, go ahead, please. Yeah, if I can just add a, a real quick comment about sidewalks, I think it would be great to um, have that revisited from a policy standpoint. And many people on this call recall how many in-depth, lengthy conversations we had about Lake Mendota Drive with regard to whether sidewalks should be just on one side or in, on both sides of the street near the park and, and the school. And and, you know, TC ended up voting to have them on both sides there. But, um, you know, it, it comes up a lot, just like the whole issue with parking um, versus buffered bike lanes and parking versus sidewalks. So, you know, sidewalks are, are viewed by Transportation Commission as very important. And as much support as we can have from a policy standpoint uh, with regard to that would be great. Um, and if the city chooses to have a different policy, then then we would need to know that as well. So uh, just trying to bring forward some of the things that, that we hear at TC. Thanks. Thanks, Ann. Uh, go ahead, Adam. Thanks. Uh, one thing I wanted just to follow up on is the, the question about the pedestrian overlays and, and sort of what impact do they really have? And I think that's a really fundamental question um, in, in the determination of whether it's something that's needed. Uh, as someone that uh, has been eyeballs deep, if not more, in developing all of this uh, material and content and structure, especially on the enhanced zone, I have a bit of a harder time seeing exactly how that fits in because the point's been made, like they're, they're, the intent is for pedestrian priority and these sort of uh, place making elements in relative to the context to be baked into things. Um, but some comments were made about getting across the street. And I think that's a really good point. And that is a possibility perhaps that whether it's either one of these or something else that designating areas that are pedestrian crossing priority zones or something along those lines, where you may look at closer signal spacing, um, all red phases um, for pedestrian crossings, things like that could be a possibility. So that's just something to consider. All right, thank you. Um, I believe Voner is a touch word for living street. So perhaps that uh, could be a good alternate word or alternate set of words. Um, and if you look it up, I suggest that you do. It's interesting the rules that they, that they have for those types of streets that are very different than what we would see on any street here in the United States. All I would encourage that we that we adopt them. Anyway, um, additional questions, comments, discussion. Okay, seeing none. Um, staff, Adam, did you all get what you needed for feedback? You got quite a bit of it. Um, it looks like we might review, or the board may uh, look at some of these things again. It may be good topics for a joint meeting as well. Um, yeah, Tom, I think we, well, I have a ton of notes. So I feel like we got a lot of good feedback on things that we needed to kind of um, take that next step. Um, some, you know, kind of build out the decision-making framework and the charts that go with it. So I think this gives us a lot to work with. So thanks. Great. And then if, if there are things that you think that we should tackle separately, you know, let's, let's make sure we get those on an agenda and do that. Um, okay, then if there's nothing further for that, we will move on to Legistar 72924, uh, TDM Transportation Demand Management. Thanks. Just uh, one moment while I share my screen. Okay, can everyone see? Yep, looks good. Okay, great. Uh, so... My name is uh, Philip Gritzmacher. I'm a planner with the Department of Transportation, and I'm going to talk with you a little bit about uh, transport uh, our transportation demand management program. We are starting to round the bend and uh, uh, look at wrapping this up and getting it adopted. So it's important to kind of go through everything from the beginning, uh, especially since, since, since there are a few new faces here. So some of this might be review, but we're going to basically walk through the need for the program, uh, what's changed since the last time you saw it and, the, and since the program was originally introduced, and then where we go from here. So I, I apologize if some of this is, uh, if you've heard some of this before. 
So starting out at the very beginning, what is transportation demand management? It's a package of policies and strategies uh, designed to, to really get people to shift uh, their travel patterns away from driving alone to other modes of transportation. And the reason why this is so important is because uh, the annual vehicle miles traveled in the U.S. is outpacing population growth. That, so that's a U.S. trend, and that's also a local trend. In fact, people are driving twice as much now as they were in the 1970s. And when you look at why this has happened, it's because of the way that we've spent our transportation dollars. Uh, for the last 50 years, we and, and, and then some, we've been prioritizing funding automobiles. Uh, and that's been a national trend and a local trend. Right here, you see the Beltline Interchange uh, being constructed back in the 60s, and even in the private uh, sector, uh, parking in the downtown area. In fact, at one point in time, uh, we as a community were, were really uh, bragging that we had some uh, some of the most par we had the most parking in the in the, in the nation. Uh, here it says that we have over ten thousand parking spaces in Madison, and that's something that we viewed as very important. Uh, but all of those decisions back uh, fifty years ago have led to where we're at today. Uh, we have a transportation network that uh, is at capacity in some locations. There are limited opportunities for expansion. And uh, there are lots of problems with that. But the first thing I want to touch on is, is economic development. So uh, this is from Inc.com. Uh, it says, Madison is where Austin was in the late 1990s. Has the talent, the access to capital, the connectivity, and livability um, that is seen in all major growing startup markets. And Austin had a ton of growth. And... Uh, they didn't have a, a, a TDM program. Uh, they, they didn't really keep up with their different modes of transportation and focused on enhancing driving. And as a result, they had they, they ended up having some of the worst congestion in the country. And I'm going to touch on Austin a couple of times. Uh, but at this point in time, this isn't just a problem of congestion and all of the problems that come with that. It can actually be a job killer. And that's the, that's the concern with congestion now. So... Uh, it's not just economic development, though. It's also climate change. I think that we're all very well aware of that. If we continue down the same path, we have some pretty dire predictions. Uh, if we stick to early you know, 2000, 2005 levels, uh, we have some impacts, but they're not nearly as bad. So we need to do something about that. And that's where TDM can also uh, come into play. That's not just a, a global problem. It's also a local problem. Uh, if you take a look at where this map is showing an arrow, that's approximately where we are, and we are one of the places in the country that's seeing uh, the most significant impacts of climate change in terms of our average annual rainfall. In fact, we're seeing over four inches of rain uh, additional to what we saw 30 years ago annually. And that's not always coming evenly throughout the year. We saw that in 2018 where we got all of that rain at once. So uh, this is these are the sorts of things that climate change is bringing us and we need to do something about it. One of the places that we can really have an impact is in our transportation sector. It's the one that the local governments, it's the sector that the local governments have the most control over because we, uh, we dictate a lot of transportation policy and it's also the biggest source of carbon dioxide emissions by sector. So that's another reason why TDM is, is so important. So the way that we are, we are able to do this is we really, we change our paradigm and how we think about uh, how we facilitate new development. So in the past, the way that we thought about new development is we have new development, that development generates a certain number of trips and we increase our network capacity to facilitate the trips that that development will generate. And with TDM, we're kind of flipping that on its head. We have new development and we need to reduce the number of single occupant vehicle trips to exist within our current transportation network. So we're reducing those trips to fit with what we already have, which is much more sustainable. So you might wonder how we do that. It's really biking, walking, and transit. So this is a graphic that maybe you've seen before, uh, but this is 200 people in 177 cars. And you can see that it's covering five, five travel lanes, one of which is a bike lane, another one's a parking lane, and it goes back as far as the eyes can see. You take those people out of their cars, and you can see there's still a lot of people, but that's a lot less space. And then you put them into a bus and it takes one uh, into three buses and it takes one travel lane. And think about how much space that frees up uh, for other things uh, such as you know, dedicated bike lanes or green infrastructure 
or just generally having less congestion. Uh, so that's a kind of an illustration. It, it is possible. We just have to get people to shift uh, modes. So TDMs also align with many of our city uh, plans and uh, our visions and our, and our, and our ordinances. So uh, it's in it's in the comprehensive plan. It's in Madison in Motion. It's in uh, Madison's sustainable vision that was released last year. And it's in a number of our land use regula regulations already. Uh, it's codified in our ordinance. And it's been there for over 20 years. Problem is our application of it has been uneven. Uh, developers are unsure what to do to, to meet TDM requirements. The plan commission and council are, aren't sure with how to figure out how to determine how much TDM is enough and uh, wh what to actually approve. So we have an environment of uncertainty and that's because we haven't had a program to standardize this process. So that's where this comes in. And a demonstration of that is Madison Yards back in 2020. It took seven meetings to uh, determine whether or not the TDM that was proposed for that development was enough. One of those meetings was over an hour just to talk about TDM. So this is certainly something that uh, is problematic for the development community and for our, our, our boards and commissions alike. So if we were to develop this TDM program, the main goal again would be to reduce single occupant vehicle trips. So we already look pretty good in the Madison area with about two thirds of uh, trips uh, occurring in, in, in single occupant vehicles, which that is good relative to other cities, but not as good as some others, such as Seattle, which, for instance, has 55%. We could improve by uh, having a TDM plan. And that's how these other cities, uh, Pittsburgh, uh, 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 Seattle, uh, how they've been able to uh, increase the number of people taking alternative modes of transportation to homework and their other destinations. There are a number of benefits that this provides. Obviously, we re reduce the vehicular miles tra traveled. But that would also make it more safe and easier to use other modes of transportation, such as walking and biking, taking the bus. It would reduce congestion, travel delay, noise, and air, uh, the air pollution that we, we have in the area. Uh, if we had less people driving, we'd need less parking, and we'd be able to support denser infill development. And we could address some of the safety impacts that we've been seeing, uh, especially since the pandemic has occurred. And we're not on an island doing this on our own. Uh, this is happening all over the country. In fact, we, redu we reviewed a number of TDM plans to get to this very point. Uh, some of the more recent examples that have been implemented are in Seattle, Los Angeles, Denver, and Austin. So again, Austin, they've recognized this need and as a result have adopted a TDM plan uh, in an effort to uh, have developers work with the Department of Transportation in Austin uh, to create site-specific TDM plans uh, that would include a, a number of TDM strategies to reduce that VMT. And that's really what we're looking at here. So getting to our plan, uh, what our process would be, would be the number one thing, the very first thing would be to determine if TDM is applicable to a certain site. And we'll get into the, those factors in the, in the next slide. Uh, but if it is deemed to be applicable, we determine the requirements, uh, then create a plan and submit that plan to the city, uh, implement, those measures, and then you report back and recertify that biannually. So there are a number of factors that determine the amount of TDM that a certain site re would require. Really, those are land uses, uh, and that's because different land uses generate different amounts of trips. The size of the development, the bigger the development, the, the more trips it could generate. Uh, the amount of parking that's proposed, number of studies out there saying that the, the more parking that's added uh, at a development, uh, and the more free parking in particular, the more people are going to drive to that particular development. So higher parking ratios mean more TDM. And then the location. Uh, there are certain uh, places where it's going to be harder to reach these requirements. So we've adjusted those requirements. And there are certain locations uh, where uh, kind of give me points are, are provided because of their location uh, relative to transit. And then, uh, Assuming a development is, is subject to TDM, they'd have to select uh, mitigation measures. So we wanted to take some of the pressure off from developers. So we developed a number of uh, different mitigation measures and given that we've given them point values ranging from one to 10. So the point values depend on the efficacy of that measure in reducing vehicular travel, documented best, best practices, the cost of implementing that measure, and then the relevance for Madison. And we have a number of modifiers that we've added to the program 
um, including uh, modifiers for proximity to transportation services, including transit car share and bike share, so that we're not encouraging developers uh, or business owners to implement measures that aren't necessarily applicable in their particular areas. So I, I talked about this a little bit earlier. Uh, we have uh, modifiers for the location of the development. This is a, some feedback based on uh, stakeholder engagement that it was difficult to reach uh, uh, point values in the, in the periphery and we were potentially penalizing uh, development that could be catalytic uh, by requiring a TDM that was uh, impossible to reach. So in the downtown area, in the general urban areas, uh, many point, points are gonna be provided based on the location of the buildings, the, the, orient, the, the configuration of the buildings, the proximity to transit uh, and other amenities. So 100% of the point values would be required in the downtown area. And then as you go out, uh, the point values would reduce, recognizing that it's more challenging to actually meet uh, the TDM requirements further out. Uh, so even though those point values are reduced, you would still have to do something. But certain things aren't provided, uh, such as transit in some of those areas, uh, that make it more difficult to, to reach those point values. And uh, I'll talk about that more at the end of the, the presentation as well. Uh, we're also providing points uh, based on uh, proximity to tr transit. Now, this is this map is going to be updated. So... Um, since we've had the, the new uh, transit network redesign, we want to finalize that information. But generally, it would be five points within the BRT uh, network area, three points within the all-day transit service area that would be updated as, as, uh, as, that, uh, as the transit network changes, and then one point within the peak only area. For areas outside of the transit network, they would not receive those base points. Uh, and that would be a, a way of incentivizing development to occur in areas that have uh, high-quality transit. And then to figure out exactly the amount of uh, TDM that's required and how to meet those requirements, we've put together a spreadsheet. Uh, the way that this would work is you would enter your development's characteristics, where it's located, the, the amount of parking, the size of the development, the use, and uh, whether it's within the uh, service areas of transit, bike share, and car share, and it would tell you your point value. And then on the next sheet, you'd be able to just select from a variety of uh, different uh, measures and uh, kind of select, select from that menu of options to reach a point target and then uh, find out whether you're compliant or not. You would then provide this sheet to the Department of Transportation. We would use that to verify compliance. This would be submitted biannually. So just to walk through a couple of projects is to see how this would actually work in practice. Uh, hypothetical project number one is a 100 unit apartment complex on Raymond Road. Uh, so we have 150 parking stalls, so that's 1.5 stalls per dwelling unit, and it is on the periphery. So if we didn't have the spreadsheet, you'd have this table, and you'd have, need to walk through the table, and you'd find out that you, uh, based on the parking stalls per dwelling unit and the size and number of dwelling units, you would be required to provide 22 uh, mitigation points. Because of the location of this uh, in the periphery, it would need to meet 65% of that total number of points for a total of 14 points to meet. Uh, one of the uh, things to consider in this area is that there is no transit service, there's no car share within, uh, within proximity of this property, and there's also no bike share. So uh, those points for those measures, anything related to transit, car share, and bike share would be halved. Um, acknowledging that if you provide a transit pass and you're in the periphery, someone could drive to transit and that might be beneficial, but generally that is not gonna be as effective. And this is just one hypothetical way of reaching uh, the 14 points. Uh, and there are any number of ways to reach this, but this is a, a pretty plausible way. And that would be uh, to provide dedicated access to bike parking. Bike parking would be required by ordinance anyway. Uh, indoor covered bike parking. Again, bike parking is required by ordinance. You got two points there. Having a bike maintenance facility next to that parking would be another point. Uh, a marketing and information campaign. That would be actually a flyer talking about alternative modes of transportation that you could provide to prospective tenants. And that's something that the city and the MPO would provide on, on the website. So putting that out and providing that is another point. And then the most impactful one is unbundling parking. So what that would be is rather than including a parking stall when you rent an apartment, uh, unbundling the price of that parking from the unit itself, and then allowing tenants to rent the parking if they want it. And that does two things. It provides more affordable uh, housing. Uh, someone who doesn't need the parking isn't paying for it. And uh, it, it, it ensures that uh, 
uh, there's more thought given to the amount of parking that's provided there. Uh, so with those, uh, you'd be able to meet the 14 points required for this particular development. Another hypothetical is a grocery store, 20,000 square feet with 65 parking stalls uh, on uh, Regent Street. So this is very similar to a Trader Joe's. Uh, so this would be in the general urban area. So there's not a significant uh, number of points that this would need to meet. It's a small store uh, and it has it's fairly modest parking. So nine points is the base score adjusted by 90, would get it to eight points. Now. This was a 0.3 in the parking ratio. So the easiest way to meet the uh, to meet the TDM plan requirements would be to just reduce parking a little bit. And that would uh, completely remove the need to, to submit a TDM plan. So that would be something that would be within their power is to go back and say, remove five parking stalls, and then they would no longer be subject to TDM requirements. But if they wanted to keep that, uh, they could provide complimentary bike share passes for their employees. Uh, they could have an alternative transportation kiosk explaining different modes of transportation in the area, uh, provide VMT reducing delivery services. So if they had a delivery service for the grocery store, get a point for that. And then they would receive three points automatically for being for locating within the all-day transit service area. So it's certainly possible. And these might be things that the development is already thinking about. And that's we, we wanted to, to make sure that we're providing pads that are, are uh, within the, the realm of of what, what folks might already be thinking about, but also get people thinking about other different methods of, of reaching those point values. And there are other methods of, of reaching this, but the, this is, is one hypothetical way of doing so. So I mentioned we're, we're looking to, to, to uh, we're gonna be seeking approval for this over the, the, over the coming months. Uh, the program, uh, if it were approved, would go into effect six months after, um, after it, it, it is approved. It would not exist, it would not impact existing properties uh, until uh, one of uh, a few things happens. So if parking is expanded, uh, they would be brought into the program fully. Uh, if there's an expansion of the use, so let's say there's a grocery store and they want to add on you know, 10,000 square feet, they are now brought into the program and must meet TDM requirements. If the use changes as defined in the TDM plan, so there's a little bit of nuance to this. Uh, it's for a commercial, it's not going from a commercial to an office. It could be going from a restaurant to a coffee shop because there are different levels of trips that would be developed uh, uh, that would be um, facilitated by those by those different developments, or if entire redevelopment of the site were to occur. And as I mentioned, there are going to be some uh, there are going to be some measures where the city provides some guidance, uh, some information. So those are, are should be easier measures uh, for the development community to to implement. Then I wanted to go through a little bit of uh, modifications to the program due to stakeholder feedback. Because we've, we've had a number of uh, meetings and interactions with stakeholders and uh, changed the program as a result. Uh, so first thing uh, that we've done is we've added the modifier. So uh, that was direct response to, to some stakeholder feedback. A number of developers were concerned that they wouldn't be able to meet uh, the TDM requirements. So the, the modifiers for, uh, for, the, for the location that was added uh, as a result of that feedback, uh, we reduced the reliance on walk score. That's a proprietary algorithm that could change at any time. Uh, early on in the program, that was something that was that was uh, in there quite a bit, and uh, it there was fear from the development community that it could penalize new catalytic developments, uh, such as transit-oriented developments on the periphery, for instance. Uh, the walk score might not be updated, or it uh, if if it's the first development, it would penalize that first development and reward all subsequent developments coming after. So that was a way of, of uh, uh, addressing that. We've also streamlined a number of measures to reduce the complexity. So there were a number of options. We, we, we've condensed some of those. Uh, and then we've uh, adjusted some of the point values to, to more, uh, more coincide with the, the cost to implement. Um, we've also developed processes for the existing mall and other multi-use sites. That was a big concern. Uh, right off the bat is how do we handle the mall? Uh, so that will be uh, handled uh, similar to how the, the malls are handled uh, with zoning, where just that specific property is handled one by one, not the entire mall site. Uh, we've also added a process uh, to reduce points, uh, point requirements, and an appeals process. Uh, we've added an appeals process uh, for special circumstances and cases. Uh, so this is a, kind of a uh, an acknowledgement that there are certain older developments 
that may be brought into the program due to change of uses, where it may be uh, impossible to actually meet TDM requirements. Now, this won't be many developments, but there are going to be some where it's just the case that it's it's not possible due to space or financial constraints. So we, that was something that was requested from the development communities. Up to five points could be reduced at the staff level. And if uh, more were needed beyond that, uh, the process would be to go to the Transportation Commission, where they could uh, request uh, special uh, special relief from the Transportation Commission. Um, another thing that is added based on uh, conversations with the, the, the zoning is that to track TDM, we would add uh, a, a phrase to the deed of a property stating that TDM requirements apply to the property. This is something very similar to what happens with leases when property is transferred. Uh, the leases are added to the deed um, at, at, the, at the time of sale. So we would require something very similar to TDM so that it's not forgotten about when properties change hands. Uh, we've also changed the certification uh, time period. Initially, it was annually. We've reduced that to biannually to reduce some of the administrative burden for the st for stakeholders and staff. Uh, we've also added additional outreach meetings, and we've been we've been going out. Uh, we were at the chamber last week, for instance, um, and uh, we continue to to add meeting dates on. Um, and uh, we have added a report out. Uh, we want to get back in touch with the folks that uh, are actually taking part in the program uh, six months out to see their feedback, to see if there are revisions that need to be made to the program uh, or if things are, are going smoothly. So our next steps are to continue to incorporate that stakeholder feedback. And our aim is to introduce this to council in September. Uh, we would bring this back to TPP, TPPB and the plan commission in October and hopefully I'll go back to council for potential approval in November and December. And with that, um, I'm, I'm happy to take any questions that you might have about the program or any feedback uh, that, that you might have. All right, thank you, Philip. Uh, questions and feedback, Alder Paulson, you're up first, go ahead, please. Yeah, I got a couple. I unfortunately have to uh, step out here in like three minutes, so I will go very quick. Um, uh, first off, I think uh, in this uh, program, we really want to emphasize uh, work from home. We've learned a ton about it, um, uh, and and that's I think the single one of the single best things we can do about getting rid of uh, uh, cutting down on the number of vehicles. It's just getting people uh, to to do more working from home. So I would really punch up uh, point values for that, especially being creative about it. Um, you know, if people are be great to have people working from home on kind of non-traditional days, right? Lots of people have, I think we're going to settle into like, well, we'll work from home on Friday or work from home on Monday. Um, if we ever get into a four-day work week, we want to spread that all over the week. We'd like to cut down, if everyone works from home one day a week, we'd love to stagger that so uh, we can cut 20% or, you know, it's not all on Friday, not all on Monday. So thinking a little bit about that. Um, um, I'm a little leery about um, affordable housing as as one of the options. I'm not sure that that will survive all court uh, um, uh, all court challenges um, because of this uh, thing. So I think we'll just make sure we got to make sure it's a really strong story about that. Like maybe it's got to be in uh, a, a TOD overlay or something that there's a strong motivation for how we can how we can do that, and we can't just say that um, affordable housing um, is uh, is is a goal there? I, I just don't think that's going to uh, stand. Um, um, I think there should be some consideration for um, uh, uh, the the number of of trips that uh, something might reduce. Right, if you plop a Trader Joe's uh, out at, at Regent Street, there, uh, I don't think you should require them to do anything because I think they're going to eliminate a bunch of traffic uh, trips anyway from people that are going to start walking. So I think there there could be some way to to think about um, what the impact is on. Uh, uh, from that, uh, that may just be a weird example, but I think I think there are going to be some places where you actually do put the development, and it it is going to reduce vehicle traffic um, uh, trips just by its own uh, nature. And I'll stop there. I will send back uh, more feedback to Tom and uh, uh, folks later. Uh, Good, Philip. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to mention we do have work from home as a uh, as one of the mitigation measures. Uh, one of the reasons why we didn't increase the point values, this is something we actually had a number of discussions about, 
is the jury is kind of out right now on, on what working from home actually does in terms of VMT. Um, in some cases, you actually see VMT going up from people working from home as they take midday trips to go shopping or different places. So one of the ways that the program would maintain its flexibility is rather than codifying all of this in ordinance, it would be in the policy itself so that we could be nimble and take this back to the Transportation Commission and adjust the point values as necessary as, as we learn more about, about uh, um, how this actually impacts, how different measures actually impact uh, VMT. Uh, and then I, I wanted to touch on affordable housing a little bit as well. So we have that in here as, as something that can really significantly reduce, uh, or significantly mitigate uh, uh, VMT and, and uh, pro provide a lot of points. The main reason for that is some, some studies that have, uh, demonstrate that um, in uh, affordable housing, there's higher rates of transit and, and pedestrian usage. So it's actually by the presence of that type of housing, the number of trips that that apartment would generate is significantly lower than if it were market rate housing. So um, that's one of the things there. So it's not necessarily providing an, an, a direct incentive, but it's acknowledging that when affordable housing is present, the amount of uh, VMT generated from those developments is less. So, and then the, the point you made about uh, certain uses uh, reducing trips, that is something that we've heard and we've, we've given that some consideration. I think that's something that we're still um, uh, considering how that would exactly work. Because um, th there are certain uses absolutely that would reduce trips at the same time they could spur it from other places. So it's, it's difficult to quantify some of those things. I think we need to figure out how to quantify that. All right, thanks, Philip. Um, I think I only formally asked to suspend the rules for the first item, but without objection, we'll continue to suspend them so that Harold or so the TC members can participate. Um, seeing no objection, go ahead, Harold. Yeah, thank you. I was going to ask if it was appropriate for me to say something on this. Um, yeah, I was going to comment on the transit points where the distinction is between BRT, all day service, and peak only service. And I kind of wonder about, yeah, what the literature says. I mean, a lot of the all day service, I mean, there's a distinction between 30 minute service and hourly service. And I'm kind of curious what we know, does having access to a once an hour bus possibly quite far away from where you are actually have an, an impact on VNT or does it have the same impact as having half hourly service or 15 minute service and 15 minute service is not just BRT. So that's just something, yeah, maybe you've already thought about that and that I understand. You don't wanna make it too complicated and service patterns can change, but seeing all of this, I guess, orange in areas where I know it's not exactly great transit service makes me wonder does that actually mitigate VMT? Go ahead, Philip. Um, so I, I think the important thing to, to remember with this, all the orange areas is this is looking at the new transit network at a post redesign. So everything in orange is at least half hourly service and that does have an impact on, on VMT. The red is, is, you know, peak only buses. So it might be, uh, that you would see six buses out there daily, as opposed to seeing a bus every half an hour. On the BRT network, you're seeing buses at very high frequencies in the peak periods, uh, as, as frequent as, as every you know five to seven minutes during the peak periods, and the off peaks every every 15. So um, you know that level of transit service and that quality of transit service will definitely have an impact. Um, so it, it's certainly that's based on on on, on literature. Um, that said, you know, certainly understand the the, the concern there, um, but just to kind of a reminder, this is based on the the new the new network that would have higher quality transit service, kind of throughout the community uh, throughout the day, not just during the peak period. So it's it would provide those opportunities all throughout the day. So it should have an impact on VMT reduction. So basically, just to clarify, there will be less orange because I mean, yes, there will be more frequent service in some areas, but less frequent service in other areas. And right now, you know, say Alt Sock, I believe that's gonna be hourly service going forward. And so that will just disappear as an orange area because you're saying it's gonna be 30 minute service as the cutoff. Yeah, we, yeah, yeah, that, that, that's correct. And uh, so that this GIS layer will be updated 
Okay, thank minutes. you. All right, Alder Foster, you're up next. Go ahead, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, thanks for the updated presentation. It all looks really good to me. Looking forward to getting it in in the works and getting some feedback on it and tweaking it, you know, going forward. So I think I think it's great. Um, just in general terms, I would say I I like especially the high point totals for unbundling of parking, for example, and just really hope that as we make tweaks in the future, we really keep a laser focus on those measures that are going to actually reduce the amount of parking that gets built. Um, Cause I think that's where we're really going to see the, the impact. So um, as we continue to, to work with it, play with it, um, let's, let's not lose sight of that and really make sure that we're incentivizing developments that um, don't, create a whole bunch more parking because that's that's really key to um, get into our get into our goals thank you all right any other questions comments discussion all right seeing none uh, thanks Philip for the presentation thank you everyone for participating um, thank you to the members of the TC who uh, joined us today. Um, Ann and Harold. That's all we have for the evening. Um, I'll make a motion to adjourn. Thank you, Chris. I assume that's what you're doing. Elder Furman, second. Thank you. Um, all those in favor of adjourning for the evening, please unmute yourselves and say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Aye. No. Good evening. We're adjourned. Have a good evening, everyone. Thank you.